Hi guys, I hope you're all doing really well. Welcome back to What the Horror, the channel where we talk about horror movies old and new. Also, welcome to a new episode of Truly Horror, the series where we talk about the true stories, the true events and the true crimes surrounding certain horror movies. The behind the scenes stuff that is often stranger and scarier than the movies themselves. So today we're talking about the true story behind The Conjuring 2. Three years after the release of the first Conjuring, director James Wan returned to the Conjuring universe with a sequel starring Patrick Wilson, Vera Farmiga and Francis O'Connor. Peggy, a single mother of four children, seeks the help of occult investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren when she and her children witness strange paranormal events in their house. So, like in my last episode, I'm going to break this one down into different topics the hauntings, the warrens and the antagonist of the movie, the demon known as Valak. And for each section, I'll talk about the movie version and then the true story behind it. In the movie The Conjuring 2, Peggy Hodgson and her four children, Margaret, Janet, Johnny and Billy, live at number 619 Green Street, a council house in Enfield, London. The family is struggling financially, but they seem to have a strong relationship and Peggy does the best she can to be a good mum to the children. Janet and her friend Camilla make a Ouija board at school and one night before bed, Janet and her sister Margaret play with the Ouija board in their shared bedroom. But after forgetting the rule or we say goodbye, they put the board away and that same night the hauntings begin. Later that night, Janet wakes up on the living room floor and Margaret hears banging on the bedroom door, but when she opens it, there's no one there and she believes that it was Janet messing around. Another night, Margaret wakes to see Janet sat on the edge of her bed, speaking to someone who replies in Janet's own voice. The other person is saying it's their house and threatens to hurt her brother Billy and her mother if they won't leave the house. Later that same night, Billy goes downstairs to get a drink of water and when he returns upstairs, he accidentally kicks a toy fire engine and he places it inside his toy tent at the top of the stairs. When Billy gets back into bed, the fire engine turns on and rolls down the hallway to Billy's bedroom door. He goes to check the tent and hears a deep voice shout out from it. He runs to get his mum but when she checks it, there's no one there. Janet continues sleepwalking, waking up in another room or sat in an armchair in the living room. One night to prevent herself from sleepwalking, she ties herself to her bed, but wakes up later to find herself on her bedroom floor, the tie having stopped her from getting further. Janet then hears noises coming from downstairs and goes to investigate, I mean, like you would, and sees what looks like a shape getting up off the armchair downstairs. Terrified, Janet runs and hides under her bed covers, but an unseen force pulls the covers off her and screams in a deep voice. Margaret is woken in the process and witnesses their two beds shaking up and down off the ground. They run to tell their mum, Peggy, and show her a bite mark that Janet has on her left shoulder. Peggy finds no one in their room, but as she's about to shout at her two daughters to stop messing around, a chest of drawers slides across the floor and blocks the way as the door slams shut. This sends the whole family running out of the house and to their neighbours, Vic and Peggy Nottingham. The family stay in the Nottingham house while Vic goes to investigate. He also calls the police, believing it to be a prank played on the family. When the two police officers arrive, they check the whole house and initially they find nothing, but they soon hear banging and what seems to be footsteps above. The female officer stands on a chair to listen to the wall, saying that it sounds as if the noises are coming from within the walls. She steps down and all the adults watch as the chair slides across the kitchen floor on its own to return to the kitchen table. The police leave saying they'll log a report, but honestly, they believe a priest would be more useful. One of the officers says that she'll ask a priest who is a family friend to pay a visit to the family. Word of the hauntings gets out and Peggy is approached by a guy from a TV show called Wide Angle and is persuaded to do an appearance by him, suggesting that it could be their best chance of finding help. This is the beginning of the involvement of reporters and investigators in the case. The movie shows us multiple eyewitnesses recounting their own experience with the hauntings, including a lollipop lady who claims she saw Janet flying across the room, a photographer who claims he saw Lego and toys flying across rooms, and the two police officers who were initially called out, they recall their own experience. One of the investigators, a Maurice Gross, conducts an interview with the two daughters 
Janet and Margaret. During the interview, Janet is possessed by a spirit who claims to be a Bill Wilkins, a 72-year-old man who lived and died in the Hodgson's house. This time though, the voice coming from Janet is a deep and gruff one, and it sounds like that of a man. This interview was captured on both audio and camera. The events are now taking their toll on the Hodgson family and they leave their home to have some respite at their neighbour's house. But while staying there, Billy, the youngest, sees a vision of the crooked man from his toy and both the Hodgsons and the Nottinghams witness Janet, possessed, who throws a fireplace guard across the room without touching it. By the time the Warrens get involved with the case at the request of the church, there is only Peggy and Janet now living in the Hodgson house, with the other three children staying with the Nottinghams. Peggy now keeps the girls' bedroom locked with a chain and crucifixes covering the bedroom walls. Ed Warren believes that the spirit appearing now is no coincidence. He explains that spirits latch onto negative feelings and could sense the pain in the family after the dad had left the family to move in with another woman. Ed and Lorraine conduct investigations to try to get proof, but initially nothing they gather fully confirms paranormal activity for them. On the Warren's first night staying at the house, despite tying herself to her mum's bed, Janet is transported into or onto the living room ceiling and then into her old bedroom, which is still chained shut from the outside. Unfortunately though, Ed and Lorraine arrive at the bedroom door too late to see the spirit of Bill Wilkins attack Janet. And after speaking to both Maurice Gross, who fully believes the family, and skeptic Anita Gregory, a parapsychologist and lecturer, the Warrens are still unsure as to whether or not it's a hoax. On the second evening, the spirit attacks again and forces Janet to wreck the kitchen, threatening to hurt her family if she doesn't. This is unfortunately captured on camera by Anita Gregory and it appears as though Janet has been faking the whole thing. All the investigators leave, including the Warrens, but they don't feel right about leaving the family. On the train, Ed and Lorraine realise through a hidden message on the recorded audio that the spirit of Bill Wilkins is being used as a pawn by a demonic presence. This demon had also blocked Lorraine's ability to sense it being there wanting to make Janet isolated and broken. The Warrens return to the Hodgson's house and along with the neighbour Vic, they try to enter the house as everyone has been locked outside, trapping Janet inside alone. Ed and Lorraine gain entry to the house and Ed manages to grab Janet before she falls from the bedroom window, but he then in turn almost falls out as well onto the broken tree trunk below. Lorraine, meanwhile, has worked out the demon's name and realises that knowing the name gives her dominion or control over it. She speaks the demon's name and calls it Valak, the Defiler, the Profane, the Marquis of Snakes. She condemns the demon to hell and with that it's defeated. Lorraine then saves Ed and Janet by pulling them back into the room. The movie claims that Enfield hauntings would go on to be one of the most documented cases in paranormal history. They're not kidding. It also claims that Peggy would continue to live out the rest of her days in the Green Street house until 2003 when she passed away quietly while sitting in a chair in the living room, the exact same spot Bill Wilkins had died 40 years earlier. The real events of the Enfield poltergeist began in August 1977 and would continue for 18 months until 1979. Just for a little bit of context or backdrop, I thought I would talk a little bit um, first about what England was like during during this time. During the summer of 1977, the country happily celebrated the Silver Jubilee of Queen Elizabeth II. The previous summer had been difficult due to a heat wave where the water supply reached a critical level. The mid 70s in London saw the arrival of punk music with bands such as The Clash and The Sex Pistols and this movement reflected some of the anger growing in the country. And then through the last months of 1978 and the early months of 1979, we had the winter of discontent, where the country was full of strikes demanding a pay rise, where people from coal miners, lorry drivers, council workers and the NHS were refusing to work, resulting in empty shelves in shops, no fuel for vehicles, rubbish filling the streets, 
unburied corpses, emergency only cases in hospitals, and not enough fuel to heat houses in the coldest winter in 16 years. This was a difficult time for people financially and emotionally. Another thing to consider is the release of a little horror movie called The Exorcist in 1973. And after the movie's release, there was an increase in claims of both hauntings and possessions. I think it's important to have this context because there were many people who did and still do obviously consider the Enfield hauntings to be a hoax and they believed the family, the mother and the children were faking the events to financially gain from the media attention in a very difficult time financially for the country. There were also those that wondered if it was just children lashing out in aggression for attention. Peggy Hodgson lived at number 284 Green Street in Enfield. That's number 284, not 619 like in the movie. She lived there with her four children, Margaret, Janet, Johnny and Billy. Although Billy wasn't always at home as he went to a boarding school because of behavioural problems. The family was suffering financially and struggling after the dad had left the family, moving in with a younger woman. The Hodgson children apparently didn't get on with their dad, especially Margaret and Janet, who were said to be afraid of him. They were also said to be bullied at school even more so after the alleged hauntings began. On the evening of Tuesday the 30th of August 1977, Peggy heard loud noises upstairs and went to tell her children to stop arguing. The previous night she's also had to speak to her children after they claimed some of the beds were wobbling about but Peggy found her two daughters huddled together in their room. Peggy and her daughters then watched as a chest of drawers moved across the floor on its own towards the door. Terrified, the family left the house and ran to their neighbours Vic and Peggy Nottingham. Vic went to the Hodgson house to investigate and claimed he too heard strange noises. Believing it could be a prank, they all decided to call the police who came out to the house. The two police officers checked all the rooms, walls and pipes. One of the officers, WPC Carolyn Heaps, signed an affidavit that she had witnessed a chair levitate and move across the floor on its own. But despite witnessing this, the police left deeming it not a police matter. Over the next few days, the family and neighbours witnessed pieces of Lego and marbles flying around the house. Eventually, after visits from the council who were unable to help and at her wit's end, Peggy Hodgson called the Daily Mirror, a British newspaper, on the 4th of September. The Mirror sent a reporter and photographer round to speak to the family. During their visit though, nothing strange occurred but that is until they were leaving and Lego just began flying across the room, resulting in the photographer, Graham Morris, being hit on his right eye by one of the pieces. There was another reporter, George Fallows, who believed that Peggy Hodgson was faking the whole thing to get a new council house, but after visiting the house, he began to believe perhaps something supernatural was happening. He said, quote, to the best of our ability, we have eliminated the possibility of total trickery, although we have been able to simulate most of the phenomena. In my opinion, this faking could only be done by an expert." End quote. Fallows, believing the family was experiencing a poltergeist, recommended the Hodgson's contact the Society for Psychiatrical Research. I'm, I swear I'm saying that wrong. And this is how Maurice Gross became involved in the Enfield case. Gross was a 58 year old man who had become interested in parapsychology research the year before, after the tragic death of his daughter. Gross would be involved in the case and with the family for a year and personally witnessed more than 2000 different apparent incidents. In Maurice's first few days there, he witnessed marbles flying, doors opening and closing on their own, and chairs in the girls' bedroom being thrown across the room and flipped upside down. On the 10th of September, Maurice Gross, Peggy Hodgson and Peggy Nottingham appeared on the LBC radio show Nightline with Ros Morris. And shortly after the appearance, Gross received a call from an SPR colleague, Guy Lyon Playfair, who, like Gross, would end up spending a year on the case and would later document his experiences in his book, The House is Haunted, released in 1980. The level of documented paranormal activity in the greenhouse over the course of the 18 months is immense and far too much to list here beat for beat, but I'll pick out a few of the key events. 
objects and toys would fly through the air like the previously mentioned Lego and marbles. Graffiti would appear, people would feel cold breezes, pools of water would appear, matches would also spontaneously ignite and furniture heavy furniture would move and flip over on its own accord. Throughout the months, numerous people from the family, their neighbours and the many visitors and investigators who came to their house saw what they thought were ghostly images, including a grey-haired woman, an old man in an overcoat and a little boy. And one neighbour even claims to have seen Maurice Gross looking out the window, even though he was proved to be somewhere else at the time. One incident involved Janet being thrown from her bed and levitating off the ground. This was famously captured on camera by Graham Morris, but many have dismissed this as Janet simply jumping off her bed. There were other eyewitnesses who saw the children, usually Janet, levitating or flying across the room. Two of the eyewitnesses were outside on the street looking in at the time. Janet's behaviour was also changing. She would swear constantly and she grew increasingly aggressive. Sometimes she would run across the room and bash her head on the wall. She would fly into fits of rage and lash out and it got so bad that in November a doctor was called out who sedated her with 10 milligrams of Valium. But after being sedated, Janet apparently levitated and landed on a radio where she was then found by her uncle. Called John. In December, Maurice Gross found Janet sliding downstairs headfirst whilst still asleep after having been pulled out of her bed. After this incident, even more members of SPR became involved and they began to encourage the family to communicate with the spirit. At first, they tried leaving pen and paper around the house and notes did appear. Some were in handwriting that they didn't recognise, but some were identified as being in Janet's own handwriting. The SPR members then challenged the spirit to speak to them directly. And Gross has been quoted by Janet as saying, all we need now is the voices to talk. Skeptics believe that Gross saying this is actually what gave the girls the idea. But real or fake, it was very soon after this that voices did indeed begin to communicate. It began with whistling, barking and gruff noises, but eventually became a voice. The voice at first only came from Janet, but then eventually Margaret as well. The voice was deep and gruff and sounded like that of a man. Initially, the voice would only speak when no one was looking at the girls, but as time went on, that just didn't seem to matter anymore. The voices at first identified as a mixture of Fred, who was Vic Nottingham's dead father, a man named Joe Watson, and even a little boy named Tommy. But then the voice changed and claimed to be a Bill Wilkins. Bill claimed he was someone who had lived and died in the Hodgson house. He'd had a hemorrhage at 72, fallen asleep, sleep in an armchair in the corner of the house and died. I had a language and I fell asleep and I died in a chair in the corner downstairs. It was proved later that there had indeed been a man named Bill Wilkins who had lived in the house and his son Terry even confirmed that he had in fact died in the way that Janet had described. Some of the investigators wondered how on earth the girls could have known this information to fake it. To rule out the possibility of Janet faking the voice, Maurice Gross asked her to both tape her mouth up and um, fill her mouth with water and on both occasions the voices could still be heard talking. A speech therapist who had examined Janet said that they couldn't confirm where the voice was coming from but that the tone was like that of people who have plica ventricularis where they speak using muscle tension rather than vocal cords but the therapist also said that this would cause a sore throat and damage over a long time and Janet had neither of these symptoms. A professional ventriloquist also visited the Green Street house and he claimed that the two girls were actually practicing a basic version of that art. Through the year that they were there, both Maurice Gross and Guy Playfair were able to document hundreds of hours of activity on audio recorders. However, for some unexplained reason, almost everybody else who entered the house with equipment experienced malfunctions, whether that was randomly draining batteries or damaged footage. But 
parapsychologist Anita Gregory and John Belloff had set up a video camera in one of the rooms of the house and they managed to capture footage of Janet bending spoons, trying to bend an iron bar and practicing jumping off her bed in a manner that looked like levitation. Gross himself also caught the girls faking events and in an interview with ITV years later, Janet said, quote, Oh yeah, once or twice we faked things, just to see if Mr. Gross and Mr. Playfair would catch us. They always did, end quote. In another article, Janet said that about 2% of the paranormal activity at the house was faked by them. But even after the media attention died away, the Hodgson family continued to claim that there was a paranormal being in their house, all the way up to the passing away of Peggy Hodgson in 2003. Janet claimed it quietened down after the visit of a priest in 1978, but it never went away. After their mother passed away, the youngest child, Billy, moved out and he claimed that it always felt like you were being watched in the house. Sorry if the angles changed slightly, it might not have, but I've had to change my battery because I've been talking for so long. The Hodgson family were met with multiple tragedies and struggles during their lives. The father left the family for another woman, leaving Peggy a single mum. Janet moved out at the age of 16, married very young and tragically lost her own son who died in his sleep at the age of 18. And Johnny Hodgson died of cancer at the young age of just 14. The Hodgson's is a really sad but fascinating story. In The Conjuring 2, the Warrens, Ed and Lorraine are again an integral part of the film's story. They not only travel to England to investigate the hauntings, but they also bond with the family, providing some much needed help and support. They lend an ear, a shoulder to cry on, they perform DIY jobs around the home and fill the house with the music of Elvis Presley. Men say only fools rush in. Man, they're good. The film opens with not the Enfield hauntings, but rather the Amityville case. And alongside the unfolding hauntings of the Hodgson family, we also see Ed and Lorraine dealing with the fallout of the Amityville case and the accusations of not only the case being a hoax, but that they too are tricksters and frauds. The Warrens are experiencing negative press, but while they can handle that, what Lorraine is struggling with is the vision of Ed's death. She worries for his safety and asks him for a break from taking cases and that they just do lectures for a while. The Enfield case is brought to the Warrens by a priest who explains the church are reluctant to get involved with it because of all of the media attention it's been receiving, especially as it's been referred to as England's Amityville. The church has asked the Warrens to go to London for three days on their behalf to assess if it's a hoax or real. Lorraine is apprehensive because of her visions of Ed's death, but she agrees to go after Ed promises that they'll just observe and leave if there's any sense of danger. As I've already talked about, the Warrens are integral in bonding with the family and investigating the case. They were sent to stay at the Green Street house for three days, but ended up being there only two days and two nights before the hauntings were actually resolved. Despite leaving after evidence comes forward that Janet is faking it, they remain convinced that something isn't right in the house and they return to the Hodgson family. Between them, Ed and Lorraine save Janet, condemn the demon to hell and save the day, rewarding themselves with a dance to Elvis Presley's Can't Help Falling in Love. So what about the true story behind the Warrens' involvement in the real Enfield hauntings? Well, this won't take long. Because the truth is, despite this being listed as one of their cases and an entire movie based on the idea of it being one of their cases, the Warrens actually had very little to do with the Enfield case. They visited the Hodgson family at their Green Street home in the summer of 1978, and by this time, the occurrences had apparently begun to reduce in number. Ed and Lorraine were only two of many paranormal investigators that visited the house, and according to Guy Lyon Playfair, one of the original investigators, Ed and Lorraine turned up at the house uninvited, and no one knew who they were. Ed Warren claimed to have had a conversation with the spirit through Janet that was quite lengthy and ended with Ed threatening to return with an exorcist, but Janet couldn't recall this apparent interview or conversation, and according to Playfair, Ed told him that they could make a lot of money off this case. 
The Warrens never actually returned to Green Street. Instead, they returned to the US and ended up writing about the case, claiming the two daughters had invited the spirit into the home while using a Ouija board. Ed Warren claimed in the writings that he had been at the house for one week, but in reality, they had stayed for less than one day. The antagonist of the movie, Valak, appears in multiple movies in the Conjuring universe, including The Conjuring 2, Annabelle Creations, and The Nun. In The Conjuring universe, Valak appears in the form of a nun, and originally in The Conjuring 2, it was suggested this was to test and mock Lorraine Warren's faith, but by The Nun, we realise that Valak had actually already taken this form to infiltrate the Abbey. And Lorraine Warren, when confronting the demon, calls it Valak, the Defiler, the Profane, the Marquis of Snakes. Chronologically, Valak's first appearance is in The Nun, set in 1952 Romania. After the St. Carthur's Monastery is attacked by an evil force, resulting in the death of multiple nuns, Father Burke and Sister Irene are asked to go and investigate, with the help of local villager Maurice Frenchie Theriault, I think it's pronounced, Theriault, they discovered that, in fact, all the nuns at the monastery are dead, with the last nun taking her own life to prevent herself from being possessed by the evil force attacking them. This evil force turns out to be the demon known as Valak. According to the movie, the monastery, or abbey, was built in the Middle Ages by the Duke of St. Carla, an aristocrat obsessed with the occult. The Duke summoned the demon Valak through a rift in the catacombs in the abbey, but before the ritual was completed, the Duke was killed by Christian knights and the rift was sealed with a vial filled with the blood of Christ. However, during World War II, a bombing on the Abbey accidentally reopened the rift, unleashing Valak once again. While Sister Irene, Father Burke and Frenchie attempt to banish the demon, Valak possesses Frenchie, which we can see from an upside down cross on his neck. Valak also appears in Annabelle Creation in a photograph of four nuns at a convent in Romania. Valak appears as this stealthy fifth nun photobomber, and we can assume the convent in the photo is the St. Carthur um, Abbey that's in the nun. Jump forward 20 years to 1971 or 1972, and Ed and Lorraine Warren are giving a lecture on possession, and during it, show footage of a man having an exorcism performed on him. That man is none other than Frenchie, and during the exorcism, he gives Lorraine her first experience of Valak, showing her his real face and a vision of Ed's death. Jump forward again to 1976, where Lorraine has another vision of Valak and premonition of Ed's death while at the Amityville house. And then finally, in 1977, Valak attaches itself to the Hodgson family and uses the spirit of Bill Wilkins to break down Janet. However, Lorraine had had another vision of Valak, this time at home, and during it she was able to learn the demon's name and in doing so could defeat and condemn the demon Valak to hell. The end, so long. Well, of course, that is until we get the nun and the crooked man, both of whom are in fact Valak. Okay, so the real story of Valak is unlike that of Bathsheba Sherman, who we spoke about in the true story behind The Conjuring, in that it's not based on a real person or a true story, but is instead based on mythology. Valak appears in both The Lesser Key of Solomon and Pseudo Monarchia Daemonum, both Gothic grimoires. In Lesser Key of Solomon, a 17th century text, Valak is the 62nd demon, and unlike in The Conjuring 2, which calls Valak a marquis, is actually a president, mighty and great. His appearance is that of a child with angel's wings riding on a two-headed dragon. While The Conjuring 2 was wrong about him being a marquis, they weren't wrong about the snakes. According to the text, Valak can give true answers of hidden treasures and controls a legion of serpents who he can summon to see to his evil bidding. In the Pseudo Monarchia Daemonum, a text from 1577 and so predating the Lesser Key, lists Valak as the 50th demon, but is again a president and not a marquis. So there you have it guys, the true story behind the terrifying events of The Conjuring. I mean, the true events of the haunting that you can interpret as you like and the true mythology behind the demon Valak. When I tell you that this episode was a difficult one to research, I am not exaggerating. Not because it was particularly disturbing or upsetting, but because it is the most documented haunting in England and the volume of evidence gathered 
is overwhelming. I was drowning in pages and pages of notes and post-its and web pages and books. But hopefully it was worth it and you guys enjoyed it. It's certainly an interesting story. I tried to condense it down to a reasonably sized um, piece for this episode, but there is still so much more that I didn't include. So definitely have a read up on it if you'd like to know more. There's so much information out there. I'll also leave a link in the description box below to the full interview with Bill Wilkins. Um, it's an interesting listen. I will do The Conjuring 3 next, but as it's October, I wanted to put it out to you guys and I will do a poll in the community page as well. I wanted to see if you would like The Conjuring 3 in October or a truly horror episode on the Salem Witch Trials. Let me know your thoughts down below. Although there is a chance that that one will be too big to fit in in October. October is going to be quite busy. Um, I imagine there's a huge amount of research to delve through for that one too. But either way, both The Conjuring 3 and The Salem Witch Trials will be done at some point. But I just wondered your preference for October. But in the meantime, thank you as always for stopping by. I really do appreciate it. Take care of yourselves and I will talk to you in the next episode. Bye guys. <laughs>